As a longtime fan of Diablo Cody's work, her attitudes towards race, class, disability, and sexuality have always struck me as a side effect of her circumstances. A blinker for a wealthy, white, presumably cis and straight woman whose claim to fame was slumming it as a stripper. She has branded herself as a proponent of women's rights to be man-eating bitches. But what she seems to fail to understand, at least in my opinion, is that her feminism treads on the back of women who paved the way for her to win awards for her pro-life narratives and schlocky, sloppy, ableist stories that contribute to the stigma of severely misrepresented mental illnesses. In looking at class depictions in Juno, the anti-Asian sentiment throughout her oeuvre and the white supremacy that lies at the centre of her feminism, we can begin to unravel this web and hopefully help to create a better future for the art of cinema. Happy schlocky, sloppy Tuesday, cunts. It is actually Tuesday. <laughs> In Racism and Women's Studies, Barbara Smith talks about the idea of what she calls women's studies or academic feminists. Women who teach, research and publish about women, but who are not in any way involved in making radical social or political change. Women who are not involved in making the lives of living, breathing women more viable. She also says women must not collude in the oppression of women who have chosen each other that is, lesbians. Diablo Cody's glaring demonization of characters of colour, her pathetic class politics, and her mishandling of disability show how little she cared about intersectionality, at least in the beginning of her career, which is what we're focusing on in this video, because it's what I'm most familiar with. We'll discuss the films Juno, Jennifer's Body, and Young Adult, as well as the TV series United States of Tara. Hi, hello, how are you? I'm Orbini and you're watching Orbini TV. Firstly, I want to talk about why I'm doing this video. The YouTuber Unpoetic Justice did a fantastic video about ineffective racial commentary by white YouTubers, which I highly suggest you check out. I'll leave a link in the description. I don't want to fall into the trap of what a lot of leftist YouTubers do because uh, one, I'm not a leftist, and two, as Unpoetic Justice points out, attacking someone on the basis of their racial commentary or lack thereof is the reason these YouTubers are so ineffective. The reason I'm doing this video is because I have a personal connection with Diablo Cody's work. I've been a long time fan. Jennifer's Body and Young Adult are two of my top three favourite films of all time, and to watch them uncritically would go against my values. I'm not directing this video at any particular community because I touch on a few intersections throughout the video, and I think it's important that everyone takes stock of the ways in which prejudiced media hurts communities and society in general. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be offended by everything forever. The aim of this channel is to help teach people how to be media literate and I'm just doing that through basically the media and the movies and the art and the TV shows that I really love and that I have a personal connection with. So that just happens to be Diablo Cody in this video. To me part of being media literate is understanding the ways in which movies and TV shows and commentary can harm communities or help communities. If you like this video, you may want to check out my books, which are on my website, or beanie.gumro.com. I'll talk more about this at the end of the video. Anyway, let's get on with it. Brooke Morio, known professionally as Diablo Cody, started her career as we know it with the birth of the memoir Candy Girl, A Year in the Life of an Unlikely Stripper. It detailed the year she spent working as a stripper after migrating from a small town in somewhere North America. I can't tell you where. To me the US is divided up into three different sections. LA where you go to become famous, New York where you go to get a $100,000 degree in English literature and bricked by a sweaty Italian, and the Midwest somewhere you would not go even if they paid you because everyone from there moves to the other two places to become either poor or famous. With the success of Candy Girl, Diablo Cody was encouraged to write a screenplay and came up with Juno, a 2007 film directed by Jason Reitman and starring Elliot Page and Michael Cera about a 15 year old girl who becomes pregnant and then decides to give the baby up for adoption. Her acerbic wit and potent expression was really well suited to screenplays and she actually ended up winning an Academy Award for Juno. 
After that, she was given free reign to write whatever she wanted, and she came up with the 2009 Karen Kusama directed film Jennifer's Body about a lesbian cheerleader who is murdered, turns into a demon, and eats boys. After that, Diablo Cody tried her hand at TV with the United States of Tara, although she said that her kind of process didn't lend well to working in a TV writer's room, and instead went on to work on films like Young Adult, Burlesque, Ricky and the Flash, Tully, and the soon to be released Lisa Frankenstein with my girl crush Catherine Newton. She did return to TV in 2015 with One Mississippi, the semi-autobiographical TV show penned by lesbian comedian Tig Notaro. She also wrote the script for the jukebox musical Jagged Little Pill, uh, which is based on the album by Alanis Morissette. And when I tell you that that was my favorite album from the time I was three years old, <laughs> Diablo Cody is living my dream life and I make YouTube videos in my bedroom, <laughs> which I don't even get paid for. <laughs> She got to work with Alanis Morissette and Karen Kusama and is screenwriting partners with Lorraine Scafaria. <laughs> like, oh my god. I think I'm gonna be sick. In her book White Feminism, Kohlbeck talks about the backlash she received while pitching stories to Marie Claire. She was allowed to write stories about skin bleaching in the carceral system, but not about the underlying institutions that promote, propagate, and engender these kinds of issues in society. Beck says, when I pitch stories on trans men weighing their birth options or teens and tweens partnering with corporate power rather than questioning it, usually over email, my boss would often write back with one word in all capital letters niche. While we tend to think of authors, writers, and editors as having complete control over their work, I know from personal experience that we're not always able to write about harmful institutions and practices in society. Because of Diablo Cody's success with Candy Girl, she was able to pen a story that we hadn't necessarily seen before, at least not in that light, and she was able to put a satirical spin on it. A lot of TV shows and movies dealt with sex. Uh, before Juno, there was American Pie, Not Another Teen Movie, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Dazed and Confused, Scream, Gilmore Girls, One Tree Hill, Skins, Ten Things I Hate About You, The O.C., Cruel Intentions, Dawson's Creek, and the list goes on. A lot of teen movies and shows deal with sex. Whether you love it, like it, hate it, or are disgusted by it, sex is a natural part of life, and for most of us, it brought us into the world. While not all of these shows and movies deal with unwanted pregnancy, that too was a fact of life. Despite the seriousness of the subject matter, Diablo Cody's take was satirical, light-hearted, kind, and funny. This is due in part to Elliot Page's wonderful depiction of Juno, a smart, tough, charismatic teen dealing with something well outside of her comfort zone. I'm going to refer to Juno with she, her pronouns, although um, Elliot Page is transgender and uses, as far as I'm aware, he, they pronouns. Juno comes from a poor family and the money in the family comes from her dad's air conditioner repair business and her mum working as a nail technician. Juno's upbringing informs her worldview and her politics. Obviously, the sky is red, but when she reveals to her parents that she's pregnant, they suggest getting an abortion. I think I said 15 before. I think she's 16. Is she 16? Yeah. And this was pretty progressive when the show is Pregnant at 16 was kind of the main draw for network television instead of putting Fight Club on the DVR for all of the kids to enjoy. However, the institutions that criminalize and stigmatize abortion are never really brought up in the film, aside from one instance that I'll talk about later. From the early 1900s to the 1970s, abortion was made illegal in America because, I kid you not, male physicians did not want the competition from midwives. They were throwing their dicks around like loose pastrami as if that wasn't what made women pregnant in the first place. So abortion was legal in the 1970s, but Republicans used their anti-abortion stance to kind of garner votes and sympathy from Catholics. Ronald Reagan won because of this. So now we see with Genocide Joe that he does support abortion, but does that mean abortion is legal in all the states? <laughs> anyway, I fucking hate the government. I, I think I made that pretty clear, but I'm gonna keep saying it. And you should be able to get abortion pills from a vending machine. And cocaine. The cost of the abortion that Juno attempts to get is also not discussed in the film. We see a class disparity between Juno and Paulie Bleeker, the father of Juno's baby, but mostly in the form of his mother, who talks about not really liking Juno and calling her different. 
Uh, in my opinion, this is because she's of a lower class than Pauly and his mother. Honestly, I'm counting poverty as the main reason there. The difference between their families are stark. Juno's family are louder and more assertive, they dress a bit dowdier, and they don't care about class divides. We love Juno's family because they're fun, and we hate Pauly Bleeker's mom because she's fat and rude, which is another thing that is just rampant in American stories why the fat phobia and it's like they try and couch it in different things it's like oh that guy is so ugly and lazy and it's like no he's fat that's that's why you hate him <laughs> i should really do a video about that it would very much depress me though so <laughs> we never see paulie's dad and we don't know what he does for a living and they live in such a nice house and this was particularly in 2007 right before the year of the global recession which rocked everyone's socks and gave $800 to every tax-paying Australian. Thanks, Kevin07. In the movie, it's discussed that Mark and Vanessa, the parents adopting Juno's baby, will pay for her medical bills, which, if you know anything about the American healthcare system, would be fucking insurmountable. <laughs> According to American lawmakers, you can't get an abortion, but you know what you can get? Crippling debt from having a baby. Republican math is having no money for a termination of pregnancy, but enough money to pay for daycare, preschool, and 12 years of the worst dog shit education you have ever heard of. I think we've talked enough about this. Okay, on to the racial elements of the film. There are only two notable characters of color in the film. Su Chin, one of Juno's classmates, and then an anti-abortion protester for some reason, and also an unnamed ultrasound technician who casts judgment on Juno's ability to parent a child. Su Chin stands outside the abortion clinic and chants, all babies want to get born, chanting it several times before having a conversation with Juno that convinces her not to kill that thing. Why she says born is not exactly clear because in the conversation she has with Juno she speaks perfect English. Like it's never commented on. Su Chin is in one scene and it's to be a pest. She holds up a sign that says no babies like murdering, which I guess is supposed to be a satirical take on anti-abortion protesters. And I guess it would be funny if anti-abortion protesters weren't the scariest bitches on the planet. Like if I had to go 12 rounds in the ring with Hulk Hogan, or one round with Jessica from accounting whose trans son got knocked up by a roadie at a My Chemical Romance concert, I choose Hulk every time. The unnamed ultrasound technician, played by Karen De Silva, expresses that she sees a lot of teenagers get knocked up, and she's glad that Juno has adopted parents to give her baby to. The other characters in the scene, including Juno, Juno's best friend Leah, and Juno's stepmom Bren, verbally attack this ultrasound technician, despite how the narrative and Juno herself have talked about how she's ill-equipped to handle a child, and that she's giving her child to an adoptive parent parent to look after because she can't do it herself. The ultrasound technician is right, yet she gets verbally attacked. The tech is right, and she phrased it tactfully, but she's put in the position of being a bad guy because Juno has to face hardship at every turn in order to be the hero we deserve. Pitting her against someone who is in the movie's own terms right is really fucking weird and really fucking sus. As for the other elements that I wanted to talk about, this movie has no queer characters and no disabled characters, unless of course you count Juno and Liberty Bell's allergies. On to the next one. Jennifer's Body is one of my all-time favorite movies. I discovered it in 2010 through my friend's Tumblr, and after watching it once, I then proceeded to watch it every night for like six months in a row just to fall asleep to. Back then, I was not fully prepared to deal with how sapphic the movie is, how Jennifer and Needy are in love, and how that love cannot replace what Needy has with Chip. The codependent relationship that Needy and Jennifer have is kind of indicative of a lot of sapphic friendships that are in media, but also in our own lives, like a lot of friendships that I had with girls when I was that age. One of whom is an astronaut now. Like, she's a fucking astronaut. <laughs> Like, I always knew she was special, but we are from a podunk town in the middle of fuck shit Queensland. Like, how are we supposed to achieve anything? It's like my chemical romance being from New Jersey. <laughs> and I have not achieved anything in my life except writing a couple books that more than two people enjoy. <laughs> 
So yes, this movie does have explicit sapphic scenes and explicit sapphic relationships. Funnily enough, the same actor who plays Su Chin, Valerie Tian, is in this movie as a homophobe who says the phrase that has been rattling around in my brain for over 10 years, lesbi gay. <laughs> Nothing up here but a tin can full of numismatic coins I picked up off the asphalt. But again, she is dismissed as an airhead who doesn't know anything about what's actually going on, including the inciting incident of the film, which is the bar burning down, what Jennifer calls a white trash pig roast. <laughs> Chastity, played by Valerie Tian, defends the band Low Shoulder, who we all know to be the villains of the film. Once again, it pits a character of colour against uh, the white leads. This time the film doesn't even back her up because we know what Low Shoulder's real intent was, which was to sacrifice Jennifer to the devil in order to be on Jay Leno. It's honestly a hilarious premise, but the racism is a bit much. There is another microaggression against East Asian people in this film, although I'm not sure if it's in this scene or another scene. On the night that the bar burns down, Jennifer goes to Needy's house and baths up a bunch of black fluid. Then Needy spends the night scrubbing the floor of the black fucking And then later at school, Jennifer looks at Needy's nails and then says, you need a Chinese chick to buff your situation. So I don't think it needs to be said, but I'm not doing this video to hate on Diablo Cody. I'm not doing this to prove that all white women are evil and anyone who's ever done anything wrong deserves to go to super hell with the gay angel war criminal. I fully and honestly believe in the radical power of change. While some people should never be forgiven and never forget their crimes, I believe that in acknowledging our past wrongs and moving past them, we can help other people do the same. It does actually take work to be not racist in a racist society. And no one is immune from that. We all have our prejudices. We just need to acknowledge them and promote the idea that if you have something that you've worked through in your past, you can use that to help other people who are currently thinking that same thing. We need to stop pretending like if you have a checkered past, you can never recover from it or you can never speak up about it or even do better. For instance, someone who has been indoctrinated into the alt-right but recovered from that is the perfect person to teach other people how not to fall into the alt-right. I want people to get better. I believe in the radical power of change, like I said before. But I also want my abusers to die, so I have to reckon with that. Anyway, back to Jennifer's body. If you thought the racism ended there, you'll be shocked and appalled to know it doesn't. There's another character called Ahmet, who they simply refer to as Ahmet from India. When he's introduced, Jennifer, who was a notorious sex fiend, says, I wonder if he's circumcised. I always wanted to try sea cucumber. Sexualizing a character of color and providing no further commentary on it, either from the other characters or from the film itself, reduces that character down to a stereotype and robs them of their agency. Later, she also kills and eats Armin, which is physically robbing him of his agency. It harkens back to this problem that's prevalent in pretty much every media, where one character will kind of represent everyone from that entire community because they're the only person from that community in the entire property. This is especially prevalent in instances where the lone black guy in a film is a drug dealer, or the lone South Asian guy is a 7-Eleven worker, or the fat woman is a shrew. It's not always a bad thing to have like one character of that ethnicity or of that culture in a movie, but the problem is with having that character embody a stereotype. You're basically showing the world how you think of that entire community. And for visual media, it provides little representation in terms of like, actors but even goes so far as things like hairdressers and makeup artists and stunt doubles. As for Ahmet, I'm pretty sure he doesn't have any lines in the film, is only in two scenes and is Jennifer's first victim, murdered right after escaping the fire. Why is my shirt doing that? What is happening? What is happening right now? Is my... what is happening? Okay, we're just gonna have to deal with it. I'm gonna put a warning at the start of this film. The other notable character of color is Needy's doctor, 
who Needy kicks and then spits in her face when she suggests that Needy try to eat something healthier than toastums? Toastums? I don't know what they are. Black people have historically been the victims of violence from white people, particularly physical and sexual violence, and presenting this with no recourse for Needy and using it as a way for Needy to actually get what she wants is pretty awful. As for disability, the only disabled character is J.K. Simmons's teacher's teacher character, who has a hook for a hand. His disability is presented as something light-hearted and a joke. His character is also presented as cringe and pathetic. And there are multiple uses of the arse with absolutely no introspection. The representation in this film is absolutely abysmal, and it begs the question of why even include characters of colour and disabled characters if you're going to do such a fucking piss poor job of it. As much as I love Megan Fox in this film, and Megan Fox is an actor, I wouldn't want a woman of colour to play her because of the way she's so sexualized and frankly evil, but Needy could have easily been played by an actor of colour. This could have easily leaned into the kind of subversion of the trope of a character of colour being overlooked by their white friend, which was especially rampant in the late noughties with uh, shows like True Blood, The Vampire Diaries, and Skins. It's just something to think about. Before we finish this section, I do really want to stress just how powerful Jennifer's body is as a statement against rape culture. We have an 18 year old girl being lured into the woods um, by a group of seedy men with ill intent who want to butcher her and leave her for dead. The rest of the movie is devoted to her using what's happened to her to fuel her selfish whims and to be a bad bitch. We also have the subversion of the final girl trope and disturbance of tropes around virginity. Needy has sex with her boyfriend Chip, but survives in the end using Chip's death as a kind of way to fuel her revenge against Jennifer and Low Shoulder. Sorry for the change in camera. My computer gets really hot nowadays because it's summer and we live three meters from the sun and when it does that it will just shut down and lose all my footage so since jennifer is not a virgin when low shoulder sacrifice her it means that instead of dying she comes back as a demon it also speaks about patriarchy on a broader level and resonates with a me too movement crowd who understand the ways that uh, the patriarchy perpetuates injustice against all women as for me, I would say this movie had a positive impact on my life overall, but when it sucks, it really sucks. Anyway, on to the next section. United States of Tara is a three season show, show run by Diablo Cody, which ran from 2009 to 2011. It centers around a woman named Tara who has DID or dissociative identity disorder, which is a mental illness that causes a split in someone's psyche and results in them having alternate identities, also called alters, multiples, splits, plurals or personality states. I've also heard people refer to themselves as a system. It's still a really heavily stigmatized mental illness and is considered by a lot of people to be not real and made up because mental illness is just in our head guys. I mean like yeah no shit. I mean of course it's in my head. Can you get it out of there? Most dissociative disorders are not taken seriously by the wider public or even mental health professionals. But I think this is getting better in recent years. I've certainly seen an uptick in mental health professionals taking it more seriously. A lot of people use uh, public figures such as influencers who have faked having DID to kind of um, believe that the illness itself is made up. I myself for a very long time didn't know whether I actually believed it was real. Um, even though I had been watching this show since 2009. I studied dissociative disorders when I studied my psychology degree, which I did actually eventually drop out of. But I did actually end up making friends with someone who has DID and I asked them for their opinion for this video and they said, there are notable gaps between the diagnostic criteria and the experience and symptoms reported by people with DID. While the diagnostic process of DID and many other mental disorders has a lot of deficits, I wonder if there are more common experiences that could be included into the criteria to improve the accuracy and inclusivity of the criteria. I know that there is a lot of folk 
um, psychology information surrounding DID within online communities. I wonder how helpful those are or if they could potentially model symptom presentation considering how people could behave in specific ways to embrace their identities. The way we interact in online communities is a lot different now than it was in 2009. Twitter, Tumblr and YouTube were still fairly new and most information being shared by people who lived with these disorders uh, was relegated to like chat rooms and forums that you had to know the URL of to use. Since Elon is so precious about the word cis, I will always deadname Twitter. I'm not sure exactly who Diablo Cody was talking to when she wrote this, but let's get into it. I've done a lot of research into this condition over the over the, like the course of my life, really. I've watched documentaries, I've read the DSM-5, I've talked to people with dissociative identity disorder, I've also talked to mental health professionals about the disorder, and I've also watched a lot of content by YouTubers who make their channels around the fact that they have DID. So obviously I'm not an expert, but it was sort of a hyperfixation of mine at one point. And in my opinion, this show does a really shitty job of representation of DID. One of the first things we learn about Tara is that she recently stopped taking medication, which stopped the presentation of her alters. Her husband Max says something to the effect of, we knew that the whole gang would resurface when you stopped taking your meds. This however is complete bullshit. There are currently no medications that you can take that will stop the presentation of your alters, even temporarily. Even antipsychotic medication like the one that I'm on won't get rid of your alters because DID is not a psychotic condition, it's a dissociative condition. And psychosis is different to dissociation. And I should point out that it's not disassociation, it's dissociation. Disassociation would mean to break off a relationship with, whereas dissociation is its own word. And as it turns out, mental illnesses are not interchangeable. But Tara does undergo talk therapy, now also called psychotherapy, in order to treat her condition, which is the main way that you can treat DID. Her alters include a 1950s housewife Alice, a Vietnam veteran Buck, and a hypersexual 15 year old T. From what I've seen, alters can be of any nationality, any race, any culture, and can also be of a different species or fictional characters. The way the show presents this is of course very dramatised and comedic, much more comedic and dramatised than it treats the rest of the characters who, in the show's kind of view, have to pick up after Tara's alters sometimes literally pick up. Tara's antics are positioned as a burden on her family, particularly her daughter Kate, played by my girlfriend Brie Larson, and her son Marshall. Even Max, her husband, kind of sticks with her and stays by her side despite the many plot points that they go through in the show. Her mental illness causes strain for the entire family and I think this is not very believable and not very... <sighs> good to kind of portray someone like this. The person most likely to be hurt by someone with a mental illness is the person who has the mental illness and if you have DID or any other mental illness like this just know that you're not a burden and there is help available. Throughout the show we see Tara and her alters do horrible things to herself and the people around her. Her alter T makes sexual advances on her son's boyfriend. Buck physically assaults Kate's boyfriend in front of like the whole school that they go to. Alice at one point believes she's pregnant and then gets hysterically upset when Tara gets her period. We also see other alters emerge such as the uh, kind of inhuman creature Gimme who is incapable of speech and writes yuppie cunt on one of Tara's client's walls. As well as Chicken, a representation of Tara as she was at five years old. And Shoshana, a Jewish therapist based on the author of a book that Tara reads once. I don't like this one. Um, Tara and Tony Collette are not Jewish, yet they affect an accent that is based off New York Jewish stereotypes. Again, I'm not getting into whether someone can have an alter who is Jewish while the uh, system is not Jewish themselves. I just think to portray it in this show is in poor taste. Another alter is named Bryce and he is the manifestation of Tara's abuser who was her older brother. Bryce causes widespread havoc and mayhem for the entire family, including destroying Marshall's room, causing Marshall so much strife that he has to move in with his grandmother, uh, 
almost killing Tara's teacher and then it's heavily implied he sexually assaulted Tara's niece. For something that is supposedly lighthearted and fun, it's a surprisingly hard show to watch and I think that's on purpose. The Diablo Cody is known for taking serious topics and kind of twisting them to get, you know, the reaction that she wants. But in my opinion, this one just veers into gross demonization. If someone made a TV show about having bipolar and borderline personality disorder and portrayed it in this way, I would not feel represented. I would, pe I would feel personally victimized. And you know what? I don't think it's gotten any better in the last 13 years. Is it 13? 14? 15? What year is it? 15? 15 years? Did I write this two years ago? No. It says 15 right here. <laughs> yeah, it's been 15 years. Scrolling through a list of movies and TV shows about mental illness, the majority of them mentioned are pre-2010 and they represent mental illness so badly it's a wonder if the people recommending them have even watched them. More like mental illness, am I right? Again, in typical Diablo Cody style, there are a few instances of the R slur and it's not reclaimed. It's just a derogatory slur. As for representation of people of colour, I want to talk about something that I in my head call the Friends effect because I first noticed it in the TV show Friends. It's a phenomenon where a TV show that is helmed and stars mostly white characters brings on a character of colour, usually a black character, in a supporting role to adhere to guidelines and laws surrounding representation before it cuts them after a few episodes. This happens to Aisha Tyler's character Dr. Charlie Wheeler on Friends. Charlie appears in nine episodes over a ten season show and is first introduced as a love interest for Joey and then for Ross. This also happens in the dramedy Girls, helmed by Lena Dunham, where Donald Glover guest stars and then is cut after two episodes. It's interesting to note that um, the speech that Donald Glover's character Sandy gives about how white women tokenize him was completely improvised by Donald Glover. Also, I love Troy Barnes, so jot that down. Did you get it? I'll wait. To be clear, I'm under no illusions that I'm the first person to notice this. And I'm sure there is an actual name for it that academics and people of colour use. And if you know it, please let me know in the comments. I would love to learn more about this. This phenomenon also happens in the United States of Tara with the character of Linda P. Frazier, played by Viola Davis. Linda is a visual artist and comic book creator who is introduced in season two as a sort of mentor to Kate. Kate starts working as a debt collector and one of her clients is Linda, but after googling Linda and finding her comic, Kate quits her job and just hangs out with Linda in her shed. When Tara finds her there, she strikes up a friendship with Linda and Linda encourages her to explore her creative and artistic side. Eventually things come to a head with Kate being mad at Linda for befriending her mum and then Linda is written out of the show after six episodes. To do that to Viola Davis, I mean you have got to be serious. This show has a lot of really good actors and guest stars, but the fact that Viola Davis was only in six episodes of a 36 episode show shows that they weren't interested in representation, so much as they were interested in filling a quota, getting their checks and going home. To my recollection, there is only one other notable character of colour. His name is Hani and he's presented as like a kind of a boy toy of an older gay man until he goes on an Adderall binge and then gets written out of the show. He's in five episodes as a bit player. That's not even enough time to develop an Adderall addiction. As for representation of sexuality, it actually does a pretty good job. There are a few notable LGBTQ characters, including Tara's son Marshall, who is a main character and appears in every episode. He comes out to Tara in the first season and to my recollection has uh, about three, I think, love interests over the three seasons of the show. He has a wonderful line in season three where he tells his grandmother that being gay is like every day is Christmas, which to me it is. Uh, every day is Christmas except without the bad gifts from family members and awkward tension between warring factions of the family. However, he faces a fair bit of homophobia, especially from Tara's alters Buck and Bryce. 
that's not necessarily a bad thing because Marshall is nuanced enough outside of his queer identity to be a fully fledged character and it also shows like what the cultural climate was back in the late noughties. Like the noughties were so homophobic that straight men were called faggots for gelling their hair. The noughties were so homophobic that effeminate men weren't even allowed to pump their own gas without male supervision. The noughties were so homophobic they gave rise to screamo. His season one love interest arc revolves around a crush on a Catholic boy and using religious traditions in order to get close to him, which kind of provides a lot of emotional depth and mix of emotions for Marshall to kind of separate his identity from the guy he's trying to date. As someone who went to nine years of Catholic school, that shit kills gay people. I've been a corpse since I was six years old and no one's noticed. And now, for something completely different. I'm not doing anything new with this video. I'm not breaking new ground, I'm not setting new records, or manning a one dog sled trip around Saturn's rings. Because where would I even get a dog? You think they just give dogs to mooks like me? I'm not saying anything that feminists of colour and other academics haven't said before, even people on YouTube. I really like Diablo Cody's work overall, but a lot of what she's done, a lot of what she's written, really doesn't sit well with me. I know that there are some people who think it's not white people's place to talk about race, but I think it's just as important for white people like myself to talk about race as it is for straight people to talk about sexuality, because everyone has a race and everyone has a sexuality. In Unpoetic Justice's video, they asked two questions that I want to highlight. How do we reduce people's desire to create offensive content, and how do we make them understand their implicit biases before the offensive content is even created? Right now this video is just about pointing out the mistakes that Diablo Cody has made, but in future videos I do want to delve more into these questions. The last batter in our horrible, soul-crushing game of shitball is the 2011 Jason Reitman directed film Young Adult. Like Jennifer's Body, I went through a period of watching it every night to fall asleep, sometimes twice enough when my Audi HD insomnia was that bad. This is still one of my all-time favourite films, and I've talked about it in a previous video which I have privated, not because I don't like the video, but because the editing was so bad, and then I tried to edit it again, and I just couldn't bring myself to do that, because it turns out the way I filmed it was awful. <laughs> it was awful. I could barely get two sentences out. But Charlie's Theron as Mavis Gary is truly sublime, and Patton Oswald as Matt is just amazing. These two juggernauts play off each other like a bow and a violin. They're caustic banter as they abuse each other. Music to my ears. They're like if Niagara Falls had an ASMR channel that played the sounds of people screaming as they tumbled to their deaths. Mavis's sardonic insults and Matt's dry quips truly make the movie for me, and I watch it again and again just to feel that magic. Young Adult is about a writer named Mavis Gary who goes back to her hometown to rekindle her relationship with an ex-boyfriend, and in doing so ruin his marriage and orphan his newborn child. The boyfriend, Buddy, is not interested, and the dramedy of this film centres around Mavis being so hell-bent on this relationship that she knows is not going to work out. When she rolls back into town, she re-meets Matt, a disabled man who went to the same high school as her and had a crush on her and also hates his life. We also meet Buddy's wife, Beth, and also Matt's sister, Sandra, who are so wholly unremarkable, which has played to comedic effect. I'm not doing it justice, the movie is hilarious. But since it's included in this video, let's tear the bitch apart. The only named character of colour in this film is Vicky, played by Hetty Ann Park. She's in one scene and she's not even named in the movie. And her role in the story is to show how ridiculous Mavis is. The other character of colour in the film is a nail technician who is unnamed and who you think Diablo Cody would love after writing Bren and Juno, but nope, she's just relegated to Chinese chick who can buff your situation. As for sexuality, Matt's backstory is that he was homophobically attacked in their last year of high school, which made national news until they found out he wasn't gay. As he says, then I was just a fat guy getting his ass beat. 
There are no explicitly queer characters in the film, although Matt's sister Sandra does give off a fairly fruity vibe when she begs Mavis to take her to the city. Also, I have always maintained that Matt would be better played by a butch lesbian. He could have all the same lines, even have he him pronouns, but it would just be so fucking good. <laughs> And there wouldn't be any of this no homo shit. That would have been so ahead of its time and I'm so mad at the missed opportunity. Guess I'll just have to write it myself and win an Oscar for the screenplay and meet Alanis Morissette and get addicted to Adderall and die on the toilet. As for disability, this is by far Diablo Cody's best work, which isn't saying much. So the story goes that Matt was lured out into the woods by a bunch of jocks and beaten with a crowbar and left for dead. He uses a cane and at one point we see his leg which is badly damaged. He also says that he has to piss and come sideways for the rest of his life. It's vitally important to have disabled characters whose disability isn't cured or even worse fall into that trope of like they're not really disabled. And I love that Matt's trauma over his disability and the attack that he suffered isn't in any way diminished and is contrasted with a character who uses a wheelchair and who loves his life. But Patton Oswald is not disabled in that way. He doesn't use a cane in real life and he is not physically disabled like Matt is. And I hate it. I hate it so much. Like how fucking hard is it to get a disabled actor to play a disabled character? It's not hard. It's not. Don't give me that shit about how, oh, they just chose the right actor for the right role because the right actor for a disabled role would also be disabled. If you think it's necessary for gay characters to be played by gay actors to the point where you will abuse them on Twitter and out a gay teen, then you should know how important it is for disabled characters to be played by disabled actors. It's just disgusting to me that people think that this is still okay. And Diablo Cody did it twice with Tara and Matt. Can we stop? Can we stop? Can we stop? Can we stop? Can we stop section? But I'm completely over this video, so let's wrap it up like the worst Christmas present you have ever laid eyes on. Which to me is every dog-themed book, pair of socks, and bookends that I have ever received. I don't even like dogs. So like, why is this important? Why even bother pointing out the inequity in Diablo Cody's work? I will say that every time I've tried to say Diablo Cody, I have had to repeat the line because I have just pronounced her name very wrong every time. <laughs> Well, I support the sentiment that reducing an entire group of people down to a stereotype and refusing to acknowledge that they are individuals as opposed to a homogenous collective is wrong no matter who you're doing it to. Diablo Cody has, in my opinion, written things that are very offensive. While Jennifer Check saying racist things is indicative of her horrible personality, having them go unacknowledged or unchallenged by the characters around her or even the text itself shows how little Diablo Cody cared about representation in her first few works. Diablo Cody would rather write an offensive joke than care about Asian people who are historically underrepresented in Hollywood. Marina Fang of the Huffington Post wrote that of the top 100 highest grossing films each year from 2007 to 2019, only 5.9% of the characters were Asian and Pacific Islander, not proportionate with the 7.1% of the US population that identifies as Asian, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. Just 44 out of the 1,300 films had a lead or co-lead who was Asian or Pacific Islander. Of the 44, 14 of them starred Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Diablo Cody writes about complex and nuanced female characters. Characters who are interesting and funny and witty and mean and evil and who have stood the test of time. Jennifer's body is an ode to both sexual freedom and the women who have been sexually assaulted, abused or worse. She at least attempted to show a view of a very stigmatized mental illness even if she, in my opinion, did more harm than good. That's up to you to decide for yourself if you think so. But by only representing white, cis, mostly straight, mostly non-disabled women, she kind of shows her true colors. 
As Barbara Smith said, the women's movement will deal with racism in a way that it has not been dealt with before in any other movement. Fundamentally, organically, non-rhetorically. White women have a materially different relationship to the system of racism than white men. They get less out of it and often function as its pawns, whether they recognize this or not. It is something that living under the white male rule has imposed on us and overthrowing racism is the inherent work of feminism and by extension feminist studies. This is still a problem today. Writing these films and shows in the late noughties and early tens shows that the work was not being done then and according to institutes like McKinsey and Company and the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative it's still not being done today. While we have instances of solidarity such as Jessica Chastain advocating for Octavia Spencer to earn the same amount as her, the lack of inclusion and fairness in Hollywood extends much further than just actors and extends all the way up the chain to higher positions of power and authority. By including unchallenged racism, classism and ableism in her works, Diablo Cody showed that she didn't care about doing the work to undermine patriarchal systems of inequality that would allow for more women to be in positions like hers in order to change the game. I'm not sure if Diablo Cody identifies as a feminist, but her works are certainly positioned that way. And according to the great theorists of the last 70 years, feminism is nothing if it's not intersectional. Actually, you know what? I will talk about it. Why do we have these prejudices in the first place? Why do we hold on to them? Why do they go unexamined? I'm going to throw some thoughts out there that I've accumulated over the last few years and you can tell me if you think they're right. Humans are naturally protective of our communities. It's how we've survived over the last 100,000 years. We protect our communities because without a community we wouldn't survive. We needed to hoard resources to last the winter, build technology to advance our society, build housing to protect ourselves, and farm to have enough food to feed our civilizations. But the us versus them mentality that came about due to surviving morphed from fighting saber-toothed tigers to fighting other civilizations for resources and then enslaving people to build shit. Slavery is a financial move. In order to build structures and societies and civilizations, people in power decided that it was easier to enslave people than to pay them. I'm just going to slightly read off my notes because I'm exhausted. Um, in order to justify it to the masses, the state peddled, and in some countries like the Congo, where Apple enslaves Congolese people to mine for minerals, still peddles propaganda like enslaved people are stupid, gross, weak, negligent, and deserve to be enslaved. Phrenology and its modern counterpart, face reading, was invented as a way to prove that African people were so stupid they needed to be enslaved. It's also used to promote Nazi propaganda if you're not aware. Abby Cox has a great video on it and I'll link that down in the description as well. Although I think it's time we retire the word dark to mean bad. These biases were also peddled by newspapers and magazines. I'm including a link to a JSTOR article in the description, which I'm not going to show on screen because it's absolutely disgusting. So if you're going to read it, uh, just be warned. And please proceed with caution. These were concerted efforts to paint marginalized people into dangerous caricatures in order to uphold the status quo of white people in power, ruling over everyone else. Any attempt to overrule this was met with brutality and violence, such as the Tulsa massacre or the assassination of Harvey Milk just to name two things. And this still happens today, it's about power. When you have power, you feel safe, and when you don't, you feel scared. Power and privilege come in many forms. It could be as simple as just having a roof over your head, something that I will never take for granted again after being homeless in 2022. It could be as simple as having access to safe abortions. It can be existing as a white person in the country that values whiteness. Privilege does not have to be a bad thing and it's not something you need to apologize for, but when you have privilege, when we have privilege, we just need to do something and help the people who don't. The idea of trickle-down economics is like absolutely batshit, but the idea of trickle-down racism kind of works. The people at the top, the government, the elites, the people with extreme power and the media uphold racist, homophobic, sexist views in order to keep their power. So having a joke in a film disparaging Chinese people 
may seem harmless, but when you take into the account the history of racism, both racism in general and racism against East Asian people specifically, in countries with predominantly white populations, it becomes clear that this is not an isolated incident. This is a systemic injustice that seeks to uphold whiteness and denigrate all others. It's about having and keeping power, and Diablo Cody, as a straight white woman who has won multiple awards for her work, has power. She just needs to use it wisely. My final thoughts are, um, drink some water, unclench your jaw, sit up straight like I have not been doing this entire video, lay down every few hours to rest your neck and back, and don't forget to blame your parents for bringing you into this hell world. I'm currently working on a series of novellas called Junk, which are about two orphans who run an orphanage, or a foster home I should say, and who collect magical artifacts. I currently have three books out that you can purchase, a uh, book of short stories that I wrote last decade and I originally published it in 2018 so that'll tell you what that's about, a book about a depressed werewolf who returns to her hometown after 10 years to bury her father, and an analysis of queer content in the Captain America films. Oh my god do you hear that? That is so scary. <laughs> If those are interesting to you, please check them out. 50% of the money that I make on my website is going to go to organizations that support Palestine and other organizations that support like Congolese people and other humanitarian causes. As always, there are links to support people in Palestine in the description. And thank you for watching. It's been a long one. It's been a real one. It's been two fucking hours. I'm done. Peace.